Good evening and welcome to the Hawaii Theater Center. You are joining us for tuning up with Iggy and Dave here with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. Iggy, how are you? I'm, I'm good. It's been one week. Busy week for you? You said you had a very long day today? It was, it's been a very long week today. Um, if meetings you, after meetings? Meetings after meetings, opportunities after opportunities. The future looks bright for the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. Um, yeah, just hopelessly optimistic at the moment. So. Well, thank you so much for all your work. Um, I know I get very tired after just one meeting on the computer. Uh, I need a, a siesta or a nap after for the whole day, but uh, I know you go nonstop from, uh, I don't know, how, what's the earliest meeting you've had to attend? This week? Uh, ever. Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of things done with our lobbying group, our advocacy group, the League of American Orchestras, especially around the federal stimulus that has been promised uh, the last couple of weeks here. So there's been some pretty early mornings, but that, that's a good way to start the day. And so today's happy hour, and we're very, very, very lucky, happy, and honored to welcome our special guest, Becca Lorito. Hi. Who are, you. you are the principal percussion player. Um, you actually came to the symphony not as a, the principal player, is that correct? Yes, I started out on a one year as associate principal. And that and was? That was in 2017, uh, the beginning of the 2017 season. And then the following season, there was an audition and I won the principal position. Oh, that's great. So really how, how does one get invited to, to be part of the orchestra for a year? Well, I had been subbing here a few times. I had been here the season prior, 2016-17, um, through someone else in the orchestra knew me and gave my resume to the percussionist and I was lucky enough to come out here a few times during the season prior so um, already sort of knew some of the people here and I think they were in a pinch because the person before had a another appointment so um, the the prior uh, percussionist before me ended up with the Atlanta Symphony so there was a space open and I'm so grateful that they ended up calling me and we're very happy to have you uh, Dave, uh, if people want to chime in and ask Becca any questions, what yes. do they do? Well, you can text the number on the bottom of your screen here. Very well done. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and we will take those questions as they come in. And we already have some questions, Iggy. Can I, can I ask one or two here to get things wow, started? Of course. Yeah. Yes. Um, this kind of goes back to the beginning. What got you interested in the drums and percussion? How old were you? And I have a follow-up question after that. that. Those oh, are wow. all the questions I was going to ask. Maybe I can just uh, leave today. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, please sorry. stay. <laughs> please stay, Iggy. Um, that's a great question. So I started out playing piano. Um, I don't come from a musical family. Um, my parents, yeah, they're supportive, but they're not musical themselves. So I had some neighbors actually that had this beautiful grand piano in their house and they had kids my age and I would go over and hang out with them. But then somehow I would always end up by myself on the piano, like tinkering around and making up little melodies. So my, tr my first love was piano. And I ended up after starting piano, um, going to the Interlochen Arts Camp and I took this class called Instrument Exploration, and each week was like, we kind of worked on a family of instruments. So we had the string instruments, and then got to try out the violin and cello and everything, and then the brass and woodwinds. And then the last week was um, piano, percussion, and harp. And I already played piano, so not interested. Um, I really liked the harp because it's set up the same way as a piano, but it's like vertical. But then I saw the xylophone, and it was it's set up the same way as a piano, but I get to hit it with these things. And I thought, this is way more fun than piano. And how old were you? I was eight. I was eight years old when I started percussion. So soon after that, I started in my uh, middle school band. I guess that was maybe a couple years later, but got started in sort of the public school music. And so 
that was so interlochen is in where michigan michigan okay. yeah and you grew up in chicago area chicago so the interlochen was a summer thing or yeah um i went to interlochen arts camp they have uh like an academy for high school but they also have a summer camp for like ages eight to through high school so i started going when i was eight years old and okay. i went for six summers in a row i loved interlochen so much it's an amazing place they have different colored socks. They have different colored socks, right? yeah. Yeah, tell us about the socks. You wear a uniform, and um, and then you, the sock color is um, designating your age. Yeah. So I wore three different colors of socks while I was there. <laughs> wow. Um, so public school, music program, but then you must have found your way into a very prestigious uh, youth orchestra, right? <laughs> yes, of course, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I ended up playing in the Midwest Young Artists outside of Chicago, and that is something that Dave is also affiliated with. Yeah. How is that? For, how are you connected to that? I don't remember. So I've known Dr. D uh, and, and Karen Dennis and the whole family basically my entire life. Oh, uh, I have wow. older siblings who were in the first group with Dr. D when Midwest Young Artists was formed. And so, yeah, a long family history there. And um, yeah, a really gr great group of students and teachers. And of course, um, let's see. Um, yeah. It's an amazing <laughs> program. Um, I was only in it for, I think, two years in high school, but youth orchestra is such an amazing thing where, you know, people from different counties and, and different schools all come together and uh, perform more music because they can't get enough of it in their public schools. And as a string player, I was always envious of the percussion ensembles because <laughs> part of Midwest Young Artists, the idea was chamber music was a part you couldn't just be an orchestra you had to do chamber music as well and so you were as a string player you were put in a piano quartet as i was or string quartets but the percussionist got to work with sarah barnes <laughs> and sarah is one of the most fun percussion teachers there is out there um and they always went in one fish off like year after year <laughs> um so i was always very envious of the percussionists at midwest young Artists. oh nice shout out to sarah barnes <laughs> thank you for now, all you've done. The, when you learn the piano obviously you were learning melodies um when you moved to the i guess the first percussion instrument that inspired you was maybe the, the xylophone um so it was still melodic, or, or was there a, a bigger sense of the percussion being a rhythmic instrument? Yeah, I think a lot of people, there's like sort of two camps of percussion players, and I think a lot of people come at it from like, they were kids grew, like growing up playing pots and pans and like really into the drums, and then there's a big like group of people that start playing percussion by way of piano. So I was definitely in that second category. I was really drawn to the the keyboard instruments, but also my experience with piano meant that I could read both bass clef and treble clef. So I was playing timpani and the keyboard instruments a lot more, and then. Um, later on, I had to sort of catch up my snare drum playing to match the t uh, like technical facility I had on the other instruments. Now, when you're a kid and you want to learn the piano, so you have a piano at home, you want to learn the cello or the violin, you have those instruments at home. But if you're a percussion player, percussion student, you come home and you need to practice. <laughs> Do you practice on one instrument? Do you tell your parents, oh, I need this and this and that? And, and I want to later go over all the instruments because there are so many, I don't, I, I don't even know myself. But so you're, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 years old, and you, I guess, have to start practicing a little bit at home. So what do you tell your parents? Yeah, well, that's a great question. When you start in fifth grade, they give you this bell kit, and it's like really heavy, and it, you can sort of wear it as a backpack, but it's really nerdy. Um, and they, they sort of equip all the young percussion players with like a drum pad, which is just like a, a quieter, it's, it's not a full drum, which is gonna be really loud, um, and, and a bell kit. And those are things that you can bring home. So that's primarily what I practiced on for a long time. But then after that, um, mostly I stayed at school or I would practice in my lunch hour. I mean, I'm thinking about high school now, but um, I would just stay at school because that's where I know I can be noisy. Even now, I don't like to really have very many instruments at my house, and I like to have a separate place that I go and practice. Do you so, have a, you live in a house or in an apartment? I have, I live in an Ohana style okay. uh, thing, so there's like a, I share a, a wall. Okay. <laughs> We're talking about instruments here, and uh, this leads us to our quiz question for the evening. Um, I think this might be a good time to 
bring that up. Um, Iggy, we do have a bottle of wine, though, this evening that our quiz winner, who must live here in Oahu, uh, so that we can <laughs> deliver this bottle of wine to you. So um, the winner will be selected from those people. But what are we drinking this evening, Iggy? So we are drinking well i actually you know i have to tell you dave started drinking we haven't started uh, we usually start drinking i see three full show. glasses on the screen um so <laughs> it is a crocus by l'atelier and the grape uh, variety is a malbec from Cahors. Cahors is a commune in france and malbec is mostly grown there uh, Cahors is in the region of Occitanie, which is uh, south southwest of France. And so, again, the bottle is called Crocus by L'Atelier. Shall I also say what we are lucky to have uh, to accompany our wine? Are you, are you sure I can't take this one? I think oh, this one. Do. Oh, okay. Go. I mean, I, you did such a wonderful job introducing the wine. Uh, <laughs> that I'm not sure I can follow that up. Uh, but our, our friends uh, here at uh, Hasser uh, in Chinatown, uh, Bistro, have also sent over a charcuterie plate because it's from our friend Terry. Yeah. <laughs> I think we need a close-up of our beautiful charcuterie. Terry. Charcuterie. Charcuterie. Terry, <laughs> yes. And Terry. thank you, Terry. We appreciate the, the support. And from where again? Hasser. Yes, Bistro here in Chinatown, right down the street from us. So continue to support our local businesses as they're supporting us. Um, and the quiz yes. question. Let's get back to the quiz question. Yes. What percussion instrument takes its name from a composer? You did you uh, make up that? Or did you come up with that, uh, Dave? Or did, did you come up with that, Becca? I think it was, it was all Dave. You, you found some time to work on your quiz question today. I did. <laughs> in I did. It, it came to me in a moment of inspiration uh, over the weekend, listening to a, a symphony by a certain composer. It's a good one. It's a good um, one. So, yes, you can text your answer to the number at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and, yes, what percussion instrument is, takes its name from a composer? Iggy, do you know? Well, I know because Dave told me, <laughs> but I would not have known because actually, you know, uh, the symphony is, I don't know, 65 plus musicians and uh, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm right by the conductor and I have to give my whole undivided attention <laughs> to the conductor, otherwise uh, he or she will not be happy. So all my eyes, well, both of them, are directed towards the conductor and sometimes I forget to look at my colleagues, equally important colleagues. And further, further and back is uh, usually Becca. And Becca, I usually see you um, running around uh, <laughs> because, again, there are so many instruments. But um, um, I asked that question to Jordan, I think, uh, who was here a few months ago. But we have, we meaning violinists, we have our part. We just have to worry about our own part. Um, and so do the celli or violas, but um, percussion is slightly more different. I know you're constantly um, aware of what's being needed and you need advanced notice. It's very, very important for you as a principal player. So t can you tell us how it works with the Hawaii Symphony? You, you have a few instruments or you have a few parts on the score, but you, it's actually your job to assign who's playing what and where. Can you expand on that? Yes, yeah. So percussion, principal percussion has a little bit of a different role than other principal players or other musicians in the orchestra. So usually um, I will get a stack of music from our wonderful librarian, Kim Kiabu. Shout out to Kim. Um, and I'm usually like the first one trying to get the music as soon as possible. And um, I look through the music and I have to study the, the music, like listen to the music, study the score, and discern um, what part is the most exposed and or what part is most challenging and then how to divide up who plays what. So 
What's interesting about percussion is that it's not always, like the principal part is not always the xylophone or always the snare drum or the triangle. It could be any of those things, um, but it really requires that you just know the piece of music. So I do a fair amount of studying beforehand. Um, and then also, I mean, there's sort of like common practice with what principal players take, especially in the standard repertoire. So I kind of have an idea just based off of like, history of what you know generally principal players will play but then it gets a little bit more confusing when we have the pops concerts or the movies and if you look back there it's like a mixture between the kitchen sink and like a zoo there's like a million instruments and um so when it when that happens i have to um, take a look at the instruments that Hawaii Symphony Orchestra owns and then see is there anything additional that we need and then if we need to rent any instruments, finding a way to get them and here to Hawaii. A time. <laughs> yes. How do we get them to Hawaii or how do we collect them from another place on, on island? And um, yeah, and then if there's a lot of instruments, usually I'll also draw out a diagram of where the instruments will be situated on stage because there is a bit of choreography involved with like, okay, I have to play the, the vibraphone over here and then I have five measures to get over there and I don't want to cross paths with Jordan or Chris and make sure, I try to arrange it so that we each have our own little pod, um, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way and we have to move around, so yeah. Um, just um, quickly, can you refresh, or at least refresh my memory, and, and name sort of the basic percussion instruments? Because you know, sometimes I see something. I don't know if it's a marimba, cortales, or triangle, or etc. So sure. please go ahead. Just the top twenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would say the most common um, instruments that you would see in an orchestra are bass drum, cymbals, snare drum, triangle, tambourine, xylophone. And xylophone is the one of metal or wood? Wood. wood. It sounds okay. like clanky bones okay. as the xylophone. Xylophone means... That, that's your porgy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, it means wood sound, xylophone. Um, and then the glockenspiel is uh, the bell set, the, the small metal one. So those are, those are sort of the main ones. Usually, like even in sort of an earlier piece, you'd see like bass drum and cymbals. Um, and then later on, tambourine and other instruments like that. And sometimes you see, what, car wheels? Car wheels? Or, oh, br the brake drum, yeah. Brake drums. Oh, yeah, it's like a hubcap. And, um, yeah, that's we're getting into really modern stuff there. But, yeah, I remember that um, Cindy McTee piece we played. I had a very extensive brake drum part. Um, and where do you get those? Um, junkyards. So you actually have to source them. <laughs> well, Hawaii Symphony has a bunch of them, so I personally have never sourced them myself, <laughs> but um, someone has, yeah. <laughs> and I remember, I don't know if you were here yet, we did uh, an opera by uh, Francis Poulenc, uh, the religious one, and uh, I forgot the name. Um, mm. The it, name escapes me, but it's the one where at the very end, uh, the nuns are being... Um, guillotined mm. and so, so uh, uh, 12 nuns I think and you had to have a percussion instrument to make that sound <laughs> <laughs> but 12 times and very loud and, and, and I think it was either Chris I think or Jordan they had to, to find uh, the, the right sound interesting yeah I don't think I was there the for that actually the dialogue the Carmelites. Yeah, the, mm. was, yeah, the dialogue of Carmelites, yes. <laughs> Speaking of... Uh, Guillotine? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was going to say snare drum. Um, we actually had a, an early question from Charlie. This one came in uh, before the show even started, so I want to make sure we get to this one. Do you enjoy playing Ravel's Bolero? That's a great question. Um, I've played it once. I've played the snare drum part in Bolero once, and... Um, I wouldn't say enjoy or not enjoy. It takes a particular amount of focus. It really is like four seconds of uh, material that you're playing for 15 minutes. And so um, you have to just get into a zone. And the one time I've played it, um, the conductor, Peter Unjin, had me play, he wanted me in front. 
So um, I was in the first row with the violins, and I was I was sitting on a stool, um, so I wasn't completely. I mean, I felt just very like sort of vulnerable, like being up front. I'm always in the back, and so um, I felt really on the spot. But I think if it sort of requires a I don't know. You have to really tune in to what you're listening to, but also zone out so you can just stay the course. <laughs> and, and Peter Unjan has been here uh, conducting a different program, so we very much in, enjoyed having him. Um, you mentioned that you were in the front of the orchestra, and that's something I wanted to ask you, and I'm sorry, I, I know sometimes I ask the same questions, but I'm very curious. Um, so you're get used to being in the back of the orchestra because that's usually where we can find you and you see the conductor's gesture and so the timing of where the beat is is so important there are times when maybe you're in the front of the orchestra do you feel like you have to adjust to the distance from the conductor do you feel like you have to adjust to the conductor do you feel like when you perform for an audition and it's when it's just you and when you have to perform with a group of people, it's different? Do you feel like if that group of people is just other percussion players, it's also an adjustment? Or if that group of people is maybe a group of string players, mm. all the beat and the rhythm, is, is there an issue about being malleable and having to adapt a lot? Yeah, I mean, those are great questions. I think that's definitely sort of the ultimate, is to listen to, to the people around you and just being able to adjust and being adaptable is so important. But I will address the, the issue of being in the back and um, in comparison to the conductor in the front, I absolutely anticipate the beat and play a little bit on top of the beat. We are an orchestra that tends to play a little bit behind, like on the back side of the beat. So um, I don't need to push so much, but I do notice when I play in other groups, um, I'll need to anticipate a little bit more. And oftentimes I will put a recording device in the audience and just listen back after a rehearsal just to see, you know, where's my placement? Is it is it lining up, is it fitting in? And sometimes it really does feel like I'm on the front of the beat and then I listen to it later and it's like, it's, it's late, it's behind. So perception is, is key and it really depends on the hall um, and just the situation and being adaptable is so important. Well, that's actually something I, I did notice with you because uh, we were playing you know, as a, as a big orchestra and I felt like you had just a very natural sense of pulse and then mm. it was actually made things quite uh, easy for us to play uh, sometimes we have amazing percussion players uh, that was before your time just amazing players not but, me but they were just like <laughs> like in their own world and it was a bit um, going uh, against the grain I felt oh, I like see. it just it's just so important um, to to mesh uh, as, as a group I want to ask about auditions mm. and and how you audition for an orchestra with so many instruments and being sure. proficient at so many things. But I'm hoping that before we, we, we go there, I'm hoping that our friend Donard could maybe give us a video clue um, as to the correct answer uh, for the quiz this evening. We have yet to receive it, though there are some honorable mentions that I really think we should bring up. <laughs> Is that gunpowder? <laughs> they put powder on it, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that was a special effect. It's so an effect to yeah. create an illusion. Yes. So we're talking about what he hit. We're not talking about the hammer. Right? Well, <laughs> or, do those two come together? I, I don't know. They might. I think it's sort of a... It's a package it's, deal. It's a package deal, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like a violin and a bow. You, you can't play one without the other, right, Iggy? Well... I guess not, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, it is... It is not the theremin, Jason. That is a, a great. Oh, a, that's a yeah. That was a, that was a good one. That was named after the inventor Leon Theremin. Mm. Um, I, I don't know if he composed anything though. That's I, interesting. I don't know if that would be considered a percussion instrument. Oh, okay. There's no striking. There's no um, 
I think of it as very similar to a violin, honestly. Mm. The spatial yes. awareness. I, I would love to learn how to play theremin. <laughs> so back to auditions. Um, you mentioned pots and pans earlier today, <laughs> tonight. And I've actually sat in for a percussion instrument. You, you were sitting on my audition, yeah. And, uh, and yours, and years ago, I think, when we had auditions in Chicago, actually, I, I listened to um, a lot of percussion players. And I'd be like, it's out of tune. No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but when I, you had excerpts, like crash symbols and things like that, and, and in all honesty, I just felt like it did sound like sometimes chef in the kitchen just banging on pots and pans. Uh, those who were not very inspiring. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it, it's, it's just hard, hard to define what is the difference between someone who sounds like he's cooking in the kitchen and someone who's, who's uh, you know, excels at, 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 at the excerpts? Sure. Yeah, I think that's a great question because especially the, um, it's really easy to start playing percussion. Like the learning curve happens later. It's very easy to create a sound compared to like the oboe or bassoon. Like it's hard to start. But I think the learning curve happens later when we're trying to hone in our sounds and everything. So... Um, so there's a couple things. I, I think immediately of just even before and after playing, sometimes people don't have a lot of control and they kind of like, it ends up bumping things, like the cymbals bump things. And for you to actually set a tambourine down without any of the jingles moving is actually requires a very steady hand. So things like that, if it sort of accidentally bumps something or you just kind of jerk your hand a little too quickly, that can have an effect of like sort of clumsiness in the kitchen. But then there's the whole other aspect of like tone quality and spending time actually um, figuring out how to create the most beautiful sounds on the cymbals. And it, it requires practice. And um, there's, you know, different angles at which um, the cymbals are situated when I strike them. You have to avoid, so cymbals, there's usually like a pocket. Um, it's like a plate. And in the middle, there's a little rounded part. And if those rounded parts come together perfectly, you get an air pocket. And that sounds terrible. So um, just, you know, having the awareness to placement of your hands and everything. And it's kind of obvious sometimes, um, like a, I think I remember he, uh, playing Dvorak Symphony 8 maybe, and, mm. and there's this, and then at the end you, you hear the cymbals, and it, oh, it's, yeah. it's very, very delicate in a way. Uh, triangle, what, what makes a good triangle player? Triangle is deceptively really difficult. Um, if you think about it, it's it's a little tiny piece of metal, and and try just like delicately getting the exact same sound um, out of a tiny little piece of metal every time. When you start hitting it, it's not the the piece of metal isn't vibrating yet. So that means after it starts vibrating, you have to adjust your touch so that it's less. It rings more when it's already vibrating. So there's a lot of like touch sensitivity stuff with um, especially the metal instruments. It's fascinating. <laughs> so how do you learn to control that? I mean, is it is it like... You've got to sit down and practice playing the triangle. <laughs> and, and how many hours do you do that? Oh, man. I mean, cumulatively over the course yeah. of uh, several... I've probably spent a few hours playing triangle, but I tend to do like five minutes a day type of thing. I, I don't spend usually like a huge block of time unless I've got a, a big part. I mean, we played this Nutcracker thing recently and I wanted to make sure that my triangle sounds were nice. So I did a good 20 minutes a day for a week leading up to that. And um, that's how it looks like when I'm performing. It's like rarely do we need to have everything worked up at the same time. Um, but auditions are a different animal when you need to have like everything in like tip top shape all for the the one day. And do you, when you come to an audition, do you bring your own triangle? Yes, you, yeah. I bring as many instruments as I can because I want to control as many variables as possible. Mm -hmm. So I bring my own um, tambourine uh, cymbals. Sometimes they want you to play their cymbals to see how you adapt. Um, I bring my own snare drums and triangles and any other small things. I don't bring a xylophone. You have to go there and play theirs. Um, 
And yeah, and I think part of it is how do you adjust and how do you adapt to playing on unfamiliar instruments? So if you have players taking auditions on the mainland, I don't know, let's say you live in Chicago and, and you have an audition in Detroit, would you have percussion players carry big instruments? Um, I, I've seen someone before bring a, a glockenspiel to an audition. It's not very common. I think it's just part of the game of being a percussionist, just to get used to playing on different instruments. It's just another skill that we have to learn how to do. That one guy who brings his own glockenspiel. <laughs> yeah, he's got it in the warm-up room where we're all like, you know, headphones and like playing on pads, and he's like wailing on a metal instrument. <laughs> so. Um, when let's go back to you, you, your formative years, um, your eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Mm -hmm. At what point did you say, "Oh, um, this is what I want to do in college"? I it probably wasn't until I was in high school that I realized I really wanted to do. Um, I really wanted to continue studying music. Um, I just loved it, and I took every opportunity I could. My high school had a really good music program, and. I was in orchestra, in band, um, I think there was like a chamber orchestra that I was also a part of, and I was doing things after school, and I just ended up spending all my time doing it, and things like solo and ensemble and youth orchestra, just it, it just became clear that this was the path I wanted to take. And you went to some very, very famous school for, uh, for percussion. I, I know the, the last one you mentioned you went to Temple, but tell us about your, your college years. Sure, yeah. I started out uh, my undergrad at Northwestern University, and then I stayed in Chicago for a few years after that, and I freelanced. Um, I did a lot of contemporary music, new music. I taught at the Chicago Youth Symphony and sort of pieced together a little bit of a freelance career and then decided I really wanted to pursue um, an orchestra career. And I went back to school and I went to Temple University in Philadelphia. And, um, and then I came back to Chicago and spent two more years in a post-master's degree at DePaul. And Temple is where a lot of percussion. Yeah, I'm to go. impressed to hear that you have heard of Temple. Well, as we a... had uh, here musicians uh, in the symphony. Oh, Temple. Right. but um, just briefly, you mentioned um, um, a new music ensemble in Chicago, um, and you mentioned before that us, our orchestra, sometimes we play behind the beat of the, the conductor. Do you find that when you're playing new music with a group that consistently does new music on a regular basis? You, you guys are very much on top of the beat? Um, that's interesting. I, I guess I haven't... I feel like that probably would be the tendency. Um, mostly when I was performing new music, it was in much smaller like chamber groups. Um, and I think it's a little bit of a different animal, just making sure that you're listening to the people um, around you and, and matching your sounds. But then also contemporary music has this additional challenge of like the music is like really graphic and you kind of have to learn how to like interpret a different language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have you performed clapping music? I have performed clapping music, yeah. That was for a concert for uh, Don Niente in Chicago. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> can, can you tell our audience what clapping music is? It's um, So it's a, a piece of music where there's five people clapping the same rhythm, and it's uh, minimalism. So the idea is that um, you, you hear the same rhythm, and then it goes in and out of phase. And what's interesting is to hear the same rhythm uh, sort of overlapped on top of itself and hear the different variations and different um, rhythms that emerge from that bass rhythm, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think that was totally. a Totally, yeah, that was great. Yeah, much better than I could have done. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. Down the awesome. Um, Becca, sorry. So we talked about all the, the percussion instruments uh, that we use in orchestra. Are you fascinated by other instruments globally around the world or about other players, uh, maybe not, not just professional players, but, but maybe uh, rhythms and drums in other parts of the world? Yes. I, actually, I am obsessed with tabla, the like Indian drum, where um, the performer speaks the rhythm that they're going to play, and sometimes they can be ext like really lengthy, and then we'll just repeat it exactly for like four minutes straight on the drum. And it's, it's really impressive, and I think it's really cool, and I'd love to learn how to do that. 
Because top was a drum that it the top of the drum you it's played with your hands and at the top of the drum you can manipulate the tension on the top of the skin, correct? So that you can change the pitch just like you can with your voice. Um, I've had the chance of performing with a number of tabla players, oh, and I'm wow. always just amazed at their solos. It's <laughs> it's mind blowing to me, and also the the rhythms that they speak. There's um, specific syllables mm -hmm. that correspond to different hand techniques, and yeah. I think that's so cool. It's very cool. We may need to throw some tabla music up on our <laughs> on our playlist as we uh, get there this evening. It's so. amazing because you think of the oldest instruments, probably okay, the voice, you know, but uh, mm. probably percussion instruments were yeah. the first thing that mankind came up with. Before we get to the new music, off the beaten path as we've been calling it, we still don't have an answer uh, for our <laughs> quiz question this evening, so um, it looks like we might be. Shall we narrow down the uh, the time era? Yeah, we have. You know, can I just name some of my favorites? Um, first and last name. First name Tim, last name Panny. Timpany. Got it. <laughs> that I did enjoy that one, Kathy. I, I was with you. Uh, <laughs> um, the Wagner tuba. However, not a percussion instrument, mm. as much as some of us wish it was. Um, <laughs> so, still missing. Should we give a few more hints about this? Yeah, we can. Sure. Yeah? Sure. Okay. It is used at the end of the sixth symphony of this composer. Oh, and there, it's on your screen again. I like the, the timpanist sort of ducking for cover. <laughs> and the whole orchestra stopped. Oh, no, no, no. no they still keep going. No, they're still playing. <laughs> and what stands out to me in this video is how close everyone is sitting. It's amazing, 10 months into this, that that is now my, my visceral reaction to that is... Too close. Um, too close. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, too close. Um, Especially with a loud uh, instrument behind you. Um, is noise a, a factor? I mean, because uh, I was telling you, I had uh, one of my best friends in, in junior high is... Uh, as a percussion player. And so I went to see him to his practice room and there was percussion instrument, they were timpani, and I stayed there for a couple hours and, and my ears, when I came out of that room, <laughs> was, was ringing. Uh, how do you manage your, your ears? Yeah, you know, I, um, when I practice, Excuse me, sometimes I wear um, actually like shooting range um, headphones, um, which like eliminate the sound a lot. Um, and I have some friends that wear um, earbuds when they're in rehearsal. I don't tend to do that. I don't like, um, I like to actually hear what's happening. Yes. And I've had my hearing checked a few times and so far, no problems. Um, my hearing, I would imagine would have, you know, disintegrated by now, but it turns out my hearing is still very acute. So um, I take care, I probably could take more care. Probably could take more care. <laughs> <laughs> we could all. <laughs> of the beaten path, beaten path, Dave? Yeah. Or do we have questions first? We do have some, some more questions coming in, but um, I, I realized that the person I thought had the right answer is actually Ron, our, our wonderful uh, assistant helping on the uh. other side of the, <laughs> the computer. So. <laughs> Still looking for that correct answer. Um, yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about music off the beaten path. What is the beaten path mu uh, segment anyway? Well, it, it's evolved. You, you coined this term as we were uh, in the first week. Um, music that is outside the perhaps normal traditional Western canon. And we have been uh, sharing some of these recordings on our website, on the Tuning Up page. So if you're interested in hearing these sorts of things, and perhaps we'll see them on some concert programs in the near future. Who uh, has the honors of starting? Oh, I, I think it's, it's Becca. <laughs> Becca, sure. what is your piece of choice? The piece I'm sharing today is by a composer named Gabriela Ortiz, who's a Mexican composer. And... The piece of music is called Tambuco, and it features a percussion ensemble a quartet in front of a full orchestra with also a full choir. Um, she's, I've performed a couple of her works before, and I love her music. It really combines like folkloric um, Mexican instruments and sounds, and it, she blends it really beautifully with sort of like the classic, you know, classical orchestral scope and it works really well. 
Gabriela Looking Ortiz. Looking forward to it. <laughs> But you had another piece of hers that there's not a lot of recordings of. Yeah, there's not a lot. Perhaps we need up. to make one. The um, yeah, perhaps we we should. Um, the piece is called Hominum that I especially love by her. But this other piece with the percussion quartet is also really cool. Very good. Okay, I'll go next, I guess, since uh, David is uh, looking at me <laughs> intently. Um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, two great violinists that we lost recently. Uh, one is uh, Ivry Gitlis, who um, lived his latter years in, in, in France. Uh, but the other one is Camilla Wicks, uh, who died uh, at the age of 92, I believe, American violinist, fantastic, um, born in 1928, I believe, and had an amazing career, uh, but at the same time as Jaha Heifetz, uh, Zino Francescati, early Isaac Stern, um, Nathan Milstein. So, um, being a woman, having her early career in 1950s, I think she made her debut at age 13 at the Hollywood Bowl or something like that, and played at Carnegie Hall very uh, in her 20s, I, I think. Um, so, might have had a bigger career if. Um, you know, she had been a man, perhaps. Anyway, so um, they uh, ran articles um, in the New York Times and Washington Post uh, when she passed away in, in late November. Um, and uh, she said that, you know, she had a big career and she had five kids also. So um, at some point she had to spend more time raising her children. Uh, but she said that early on when she was performing all over the places, uh, she usually had a, a baby in, in her stomach when she was performing the Brahms Fighting Concerto. But anyway, the piece I had uh, in mind, uh, she, um, uh, she recorded, uh, I think, the William Walton Violin Concerto. Uh, William Walton wrote that concerto for Yaha Hefetz, actually, but uh, she played it very beautifully. And so William Walton, Dave, is famous to, for writing uh, a violin concerto, which is not performed very often. Uh, he also wrote a cello concerto, but uh, he's very well known for writing a viola concerto. Have you uh, played that uh, concerto? Jane? You know, it wasn't my favorite. Uh, I, I, it just didn't really lay well for me. Um, but it's, it's like the plight of a composer who writes a viola concerto. It's like, oh, yeah, he's the one who wrote the viola concerto. He actually wrote a beautiful piano quartet uh, when he was quite young. Um, as with other, Mahler, for example, also wrote a, a piano quartet at a very young age. Um, yes. not, not, not for percussion instruments, but um, so, Mahler. So yeah, that's the piece. William yes. Walton, <laughs> uh, British composer of the early 20th century. And Dave? Beautiful. Yeah, you, so I've been, a, a few weeks ago, actually the close of season one of Tuning Up, uh, we had our guest, Mari, uh, Ushihara joined us, and she gifted me her, her newest book, Dearest Lenny. And I've really I've enjoyed reading that over the past couple of weeks and was reading about uh, some of the tours that the New York Phil did to Japan um, when Ozawa was starting to conduct with them. And, of course, uh, Bernstein was conducting the orchestra as well and was reading about this piece called November Steps, written by Takamitsu. Um, and... I had not heard it before, but it was written in 1967 for the 125th anniversary of the New York Philharmonic and uh, was toured to Japan with Ozawa conducting. Um, and I had a, I, I'd never heard it, and I listened to it over the weekend for the first time. And it's this really phenomenal blend of traditional Japanese music and instruments and what we think of as Western classical music. And um, Takamitsu, I, I believe, was actually born in China and kind of was inspired by mostly French composers. Um, and it wasn't until kind of the middle of his career where he really brought this uh, Japanese tradition into his music. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful piece, November Steps. And also, as I was learning about Takamitsu, I, I was blown away. He wrote over 100 uh, movie scores during his career. Um, mostly Japanese films, but uh, I, not someone who I was familiar with as a film score as well. So, uh, November Steps by Takamitsu is mine. For and this I week. believe that uh, Takamitsu actually performed here in Hawaii before my time um, as a composer, of course. 
um, we with the back then might have been called the Honol Symphony. We actually performed the uh, uh, one of his works. It was probably the last time uh, we did. Uh, I think the, the 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 name of the piece was called the Archipelago S, and so just like its name says, uh, we had the orchestra. I think it's a piece for about twenty some. Uh, musicians, so we were divided in three um, ensembles, just like small islands of an archipelago. Physically uh, distanced. In, in the in the in the concert hall. Yeah. So, do we have uh, no answer yet? We do. We do. Uh, the winner this evening, they got the composer correct. Uh, Jason, uh, we've got a, another bottle of wine headed your way this week. Uh, yes, it is. The Mahler box. And do we know if the Mahler box is being used for other works other than Mahler? You know, I know there is a percussion ensemble piece that is uh, newly written within the last 20 years that thought, you know, we need more Mahler box. So there's, I know it shows up at least somewhere else. <laughs> box and hammer. Box and hammer. And yeah. hammer. Oh, uh, yeah, with the hammer, right. Yeah. Just like the violin and the bow. Yes. Uh, um, Becca, I, I keep asking the same question to everyone because I'm fascinated by that aspect. When we perform and when we're on stage, when we practice, you know, everything works fine and your heartbeat is fine, whatever. Uh, then we perform in public for an audition or competition or concert. There's a little bit of adrenaline rushing. There's your heartbeat beating a little faster. So the first thing that gets affected is your pulse and your beat and your rhythm. Um, I know it affects me, definitely. How does it affect percussion players? And if it does, how do you learn how to deal with it? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think I like, I have a theory that um, nerves manifest in the exact way that you do not want them to. Like, like for a trumpet player, they get dry mouth. I don't think I get dry mouth. I mean, maybe I do, but I just notice that my hands shake or my hands get sweaty. And maybe a trumpet player, for instance, will also get sweaty palms and shaky hands, but they don't really notice that as much. So I think it's interesting. Um, so yeah, I notice that my hands will shake um, and my palms will sweat and my heart rate increases. And um, I have some like muscular um, techniques to like, if I'm playing snare drum, for instance, I'll, uh, if I turn over a little bit more, if I utilize more of the larger muscles rather than the smaller muscles, I have a better chance of controlling what I'm doing. Um, I try to practice being nervous. Um, and then I also- How do you do that? Like I, I, I try to play for people in front of people. Like Dave? Does Dave <laughs> Not yet. No, I, I, you're I, welcome yeah, to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Come over to the union sometime and <laughs> make me nervous. Um, have, I, yeah. Have you done the like running up and down the stairs so you're I, out of breath? I have. Or like doing some push ups or something like yeah. that just to sort of recreate the adrenaline a little Did bit. Did you go to New World Symphony? Or? I have subbed there a number okay. of times, but I, 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 I know they're kind of very into training, yeah. things like that. And so I, was I think there's something to that, especially with like audition training I think yeah sort of like adversity training is is really helpful if you try to again control the variables if you if you expect that you'll get nervous or at least prepare to for you know whatever happens if you do get nervous I also do um, a lot of things before to just sort of calm myself down I have a meditation practice I use um, like uh, tapping as like a technique to help um, eliminate some of the adrenaline, and it works for me. It really That's helps. Great. Well, I'll have to call you up. Um, <laughs> did you notice? I don't know if it's just me or other people, but with the pandemic, with those concerts we've had, uh, we've had to wear a mask, and so I think breathing is very important when you perform, and when you get nervous, you know, your breathing gets altered, and so I, I, I found that in a pressure situation, you try to control your breathing, but then you're wearing mask. So there was another uh, um, <laughs> obstacle, I guess, in, in, in performing. Did you 
was that a big deal for you? Or no? Yeah, you know, I noticed the breathing, but also for me, when I noticed, especially when we played um, Carnival of the Animals, I was playing keyboard instruments, and I have to look down to make sure I play the right notes, you know? And the, we have our matching um, HSO masks, and there, it fits a little bit bigger on my face than my normal mask. So it was sort of ballooning out a little bit. And so it, it sort of got in the way for my vision to look at the instrument. So I had to get creative. I like had to tie it tighter and um, just, you know, f pandemic things. Yes. Pandemic. <laughs> Nothing we can't adapt to. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you said the word adversary, uh, adversity. Um, what have the te last 10 months been like for you? Oh, it has been a wild ride. I mean, it's been uh, a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, what else, um, what else I can do, how I can dive into music in different ways. I've been studying opera because it's not something I know a lot about. So I've been just sort of casually and slowly listening to operas and studying the music and the scores and learning the stories. And um, that's been kind of a fun project for me. Um, I also um, enrolled and completed a certification as a health coach and nutritionist and have started a, like a, a coaching practice. Mm -hmm. So it's been a really cool time that I've been able to have the time and space to sort of explore other interests, but I'm really looking forward to getting back to playing. I miss it a lot. And um, this kind of thirst for knowledge and learning things, like that, did you always have that one since you were young? Or? I guess so. Yeah, I all of the I have like a number of certifications in sort of like health and wellness, and it all happened over the course of a long period of time. And I guess it just it interested me, and I wanted to know more, so I just sort of kept going with it. And more and more pieces came together, and so it's been very interesting. Yeah, I tend to I like to look things up and and understand why is something effective. When I started meditating, it was sort of like the first time I, I did that, I was like, why was that so awesome? And um, I started researching it and started learning like how good it is for you. And I think that really helps also if you know why something is effective, if you know why something is good for you, it's motivating to actually incorporate that into your life. Very good. And I understand that even though the last few months have not been very um, rosy, You've had some, yourself, some, some high lights of high moments. Can yes. you tell us? I, you said it was okay to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just got married. Um, hi, Zach. Um, yeah, my husband is um, uh, in, the, in the military. He's in the Navy. He's a um, technician and a mechanical engineer. Sorry, I just blanked on that. <laughs> Um, there's so many acronyms I was, I was explaining to Dave before. I'm like, I don't know. I'm learning a lot. Um, I'm learning a lot about the military. So, yeah, he's wonderful. And we just got married um, in December. And we just had a very small ceremony in our backyard, which overlooks Diamond Head um, at sunset. And it was beautiful and intimate and very nice. Wonderful. Well, congratulations <laughs> to you, you and to Zach. Congratulations. I, my brother is... Uh, Lives in France. He's a French citizen, and so he's a French Navy reservist. Mm. But he's fascinated by the U.S. Navy, and always asks me to bring to go to I don't know Prover and bring you know Navy T-shirts, sweatshirts, oh. caps, and so I'm gonna have to uh, get your sure, husband's yeah. uh, number so I can uh, bring more. Yeah, we can hook it up gift, for you uh, for my brother. So. <laughs> Yeah, a whole ship. That's great, <laughs> yes. Or, or, or craft carrier, yeah. So this is a question that I like to ask every week on the show. What does the future of the symphony look like? The Hawaii mm -hmm. Symphony, classical music, um, generally, you know, for the industry, for us here in Hawaii? Wouldn't we all like to know? <laughs> um, my personal opinion is that we are going to shift to more virtual concerts. Um, I think it's sort of inevitable. We have amazing technology at our fingertips, and I think it's just sort of, um, it's the future of music. Um, I think also it's going to be um, much more that we need to amplify and strengthen the voices of um, BIPOC and especially like Hawaiian, indigenous, um, native 
people. I mean, we have such a unique voice here, and I think it's really imperative that we, um, you know, use our cultural megaphone to bring those messages out. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. I mean, one of my favorite pieces to play in the orchestra is the Hawaiian Birds, mm -hmm. which is, that's like our signature piece, and I think um, we should do more of that, more things like that. Great. <laughs> I like it. I like it too. Yeah, of course, uh, something hybrid. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's so much knowledge that, maybe not myself, but that you, Dave, and, and Greg, and, and, and Donald, and, and Bob have learned uh, doing those virtual concerts using technology that you didn't have a grasp of so much when we first started. And it would be uh, unwise not to use that knowledge and technology. So I think uh, a hybrid version, but of course, uh, we all miss uh, the interaction, the in-person attendance, not because we want to hear you applaud us, but uh, you know, music is a two-way uh, dialogue, communication between the listeners, the musicians, and and we uh, learn from everyone's feedback. So mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that will come sooner than later. Yes, we'll get back to it very soon here. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us this Thank week. It was a lot so of fun to, to talk with you that, you know, we talk, Iggy and I always talk about this being the little oasis we have here on Tuesdays, uh, kind of normalcy uh, in a, a very strange time. And as we see more and more parts of normal return or a new normal, uh, I'm confident that the, the symphony will be back very soon at its full capacity. Uh, both audience and on stage. And each day that goes by, we're getting a little bit closer to that goal. So, and we can't do that without, of course, your support. We're grateful for all of you for tuning in and telling people about what the HSO is doing. And of course, uh, your financial support uh, is very much appreciated as well. So on that note, Iggy, did you have something else to add? Um, you know, um, Getting back to the percussion instrument, there, there's, there's something so, not religious, but it's ceremonial. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. you have to have, I mean, of course, we all respect our own instruments, but, you know, they, I think the, the drums play such a integral part in ceremonies or religious services, and it, it almost feels like it's a, it's more than a musical instrument. Do you feel sometimes that when you play, that maybe you have to bow to the instrument? I don't know. Does it take a, a dimension that's bigger than the music itself? That's really cool. I mean, you're probably one of the, f the first people I've heard to um, pay so much respect to the percussion family. <laughs> I feel like normally I'm defending its honor. Um, you know, I really do feel like it hits people on a really core and visceral level. Um, it, I mean, the sound is big. I'm thinking of like, you know, big bass drums. It, it cuts deep into the core of your body. The vibrations are, are big and wide. And, um, and I think it moves a lot of people. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm aware that I, I hold a very powerful tool do, yeah. um, and, and, you know, try to have respect for that. <laughs> Be before we go, we have to talk about Mahler's Sixth Symphony, though. That was our quiz question. You've talked about this sort of um, the sacred. It, it obviously, it's been a while since he's had the full arsenal of the percussion in the back of the orchestra for him to say, "Quiet down, please." So, can you tell us you've you've had the opportunity to play the Mahler box and hammer? I have. Yes. And can you tell us a little bit? You know, there's the story about Mahler and. The, the maybe the number of hits that he originally had planned for the symphony and then changed his mind. Can you take us through that? Sure, yeah. I think that originally there were five strikes, and then, um, and then upon editing, ed editing it, he thought, maybe that's overkill. Um, and I know there are some composers that can be convinced that you can add those two back in. Yeah. Um, some people do two, and then there's also three. And I, I've always heard of this folklore of, of Mahler being concerned that this 
last strike would be the one that killed him. Oh. He was a very, uh, my understanding is that he was a very, um, uh, you know, superstitious. superstitious in that way. So Interesting. what is it like? Did you, so we, the video we saw, there was a little <laughs> bit of theatrics. I think there may be some, some baby with the LeBron James uh, <laughs> uh, there at the end. Um, what's it like? Um, okay, well, I have to say um, there's a lot of airtime with that. You, you got to bring the hammer over your head and, and every orchestra has a different rendition of the hammer and the box. So um, it looks different. It, it weighs a different amount and, and you need to get used to it. Like you'll notice that guy's hand is really up close to yeah. the, the hammer part and then he's holding it down here and, you know, lifting it over your head. It's a, it's a full body thing, but timing it is, is difficult because how, it's not a motion I'm, I'm used to doing like from all the way up over my head. So, um, it took a few swings at it before I really understood how much, uh, how much time I needed mm -hmm. so that I could place it right. <laughs> well, everyone needs to go and listen to Mahler's Sixth Symphony now. Um, you'll need to carve some time out of your schedule, but uh, it's well worth it. <laughs> uh, wonderful again to have you, Becca. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Iggy, always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Becca. Thank you Thank so you much for having me. It was a and, pleasure. Yeah. And tune, us, uh, tune in next week for Tuning Up. Um, our guest will be Jake Shurmbakuro will be joining us uh, in the hot seat here. Um, and for those of you who tuned in expecting Bernie Sanders, um, our, our apologies. But a yeah. thank you to Ron uh, for his assistance in putting that one together. Uh, have a great week. Thank you again for all of your support, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Mahalo.